Preface Early one morning in the spring of 1973, I was invited for the first time to accompany my spiritual master on a morning walk. As the sun rose on a sleeping Los Angeles, I climbed wide-eyed at the prospect of intimate association with my guru into a small white Toyota station wagon along with two of my godbrothers and our Prabhupada. We drove to Javiot Hills, one of the two places where Prabhupada would take his morning walk when in Los Angeles. He preferred Venice Beach, but variety has value. On this particular morning, the park was dumb and the ground had just been irritated. After Prabhupada indirectly let us know his preference for Venice Beach through his critique of the park, he spoke to us about the shortcomings of modern science. In the course of questioning the possibility of something arising out of nothing, the conversation itself dissipated and we walked in silence. The little clumps of earth scattered all about appeared like stools to the uninformed, and I found myself questioning why we had brought Prabhupada to this place. Were they stools? Prabhupada broke the silence to ask this very question. Too embarrassed and ignorant to answer, I left it to the others, one of whom explained in brief the art of eating the earth. The silence continued, and I felt the need to absorb my mind in spiritual thoughts, lest I not take full advantage of the opportunity at hand. Crossing the field as if influenced by a force beyond myself, I thought spontaneously of Rindavan, Krishna and his cowherds and cows. Almost effortlessly, my mind became absorbed in a sense of the pastoral setting of Rindavan and Krishna's leelas of cowherding with his friends. Where were we really? Clent in saffron robes, an elderly man of five feet four, no more, walked with an eternal youthfulness that questioned the apparent youth of those who walked beside him. With his head held high in absolute confidence, he challenged the meta-narrative of modern science, making it seem as if scientific materialism could be crushed by a mere poke from his cane. His glance so captivating, benedicting, his eyes tinged with the ointment of love of Krishna, our beloved Prabhupada wanted the world to stop and just love Krishna. He wanted us to be his instruments through which this would be accomplished. Prabhupada compellingly told us to write articles, publish them and replace the prevailing paradigm with Krishna's message. Then someone mentioned my name and success in the field of distributing his books. Prabhupada turned to me and said, By distributing these books, you are doing a great service to Krishna. He, Krishna, wanted to say to everyone, Sarva Dharman Parityajya Mam Ekam Shadanam Raja. He comes therefore, so anyone who is doing the same service, he is recognized by Krishna very nicely. That is stated in the Bhagavad Gita. Naja Tasman Manushyeshu. In the human society, nobody is dearer than he who is helping preaching work. In the first words he ever spoke to me, Prabhupada cited 
three verses from the Bhagavad Gita, all from the 18th chapter. First, he cited the conclusion of the Gita. Forgoing all religious injunctions, take exclusive refuge in me. Then he cited Krishna's two verses of praise for those involved in disseminating this conclusion. The actual verses run thus. One who explains this supreme secret to my devotees engages in the highest devotion to me. He will undoubtedly come to me. No one in this world is more dear to me than he is, nor will there ever be anyone on earth more dear to me. In the Gita commentary, Prabhupada elaborates on Krishna's verse regarding those who explain this message. Anyone, however, who tries sincerely to present Bhagavad Gita as it is, will advance in devotional activities and reach the pure devotional state of life. As a result of such pure devotion, he is sure to go back home, back to Godhead. By the phrase, as it is, which became the subtitle of Prabhupada's edition of the Gita, Prabhupada meant explaining the Bhagavad Gita from a devotional perspective. Only one who loves Krishna is privy to the deepest implications of his eloquent speech. After Prabhupada encouraged all of us to write and distribute books about Krishna, one of my god-brothers commented, We are simply your puppets, Srila Prabhupada. You're giving us the books. This did not seem to satisfy Srila Prabhupada, and he made the following reference to the Guru Parampara. No, we are all puppets of Krishna. I am also a puppet. This is the Siblic succession. While he humbly gave all credits to his own guru and Krishna for anything he had accomplished, he implied that becoming the instrument of guru and Krishna had a dynamic application. It involved not merely circulating the books of one's guru, but writing books oneself as he had done. This was the example he set. While writing his own books, he considered that he was merely acting as a puppet of Guru and Krishna. Becoming the puppet of one's Guru is about getting a spiritual life and thinking for oneself within the parameters of what is actually spiritual. Looking back at that spring morning in Los Angeles, Javier Hills, as I myself turned 50, I felt that my life would be incomplete if I did not author an edition of Bhagavad Gita in contemporary language. Faithfully distributing that which another has drawn down from the infinite should in time bear the fruit of enabling such a distributor to draw down something himself. This is the fruit of the seed that Sri Guru plants in the heart of the disciple. In the form of this edition of Bhagavad Gita, I have been able to taste this fruit to some extent only by my spiritual master's grace and he sent several persons to assist me in this effort. I am grateful to all of them. May he bless them, and may Sri Chaitanya, who is none other than Radha Krishna combined, continue to bless the world with this doctrine of love of Godhead. May that blessing come in the form of devotional literature written from within the cultural context of devotees of Krishna who are now taking birth all over the world. Swami B. V. Tripurari